this evening we are here caught in the web of time and of space but understanding what is referred to by the great masters of wisdom as the hallowing of space one cannot hallow space without hallowing time. And time as space are both increments of eternity. They are finite manifestations so called by our mind, but they are infinite reality passing through the eye of the needle of our consciousness where the magnetization of values where the stamp of our esteem <coughs> rests upon the holy substance that comes from God that we call time, cow, or space, desh, which is the expansion in the divine mind and in the divine purpose of an opportunity given to each one of us which impartation is also given unto the world. For all have the same equal opportunities under the law, but all do not of necessity respond with the same grace to this opportunity which all receive. Neither are all, even though they are created equal, equal in the sense that through the domain of time, while passing through this domain, they have of necessity made the correct use of life's opportunities in the past, in the present, and perhaps some will not in the future. We have no right to proscribe what individuals will do with this blessed opportunity. We can only hope and we can only serve, and in this we resemble, one and all, we resemble our Creator, our Maker, who also must wait patiently and cannot necessarily accelerate the process simply because of some aspect of himself which men think of as the wrath of God. For God is a being of love, and that which men term wrath as the aspect of returning karma that which men term wrath is but another name for infinite love. For the chastisements of God are also given in hope that his beloved Son manifest in varying types of individuals will at last respond to the great domain of reality, awake from his sleep of the centuries, and come to realize at last that God is in him. Which realization, when it is engaged in by the teeth of the mind over a prolonged period of time, will create in us all an inward patience and cosmic diligence, which itself will make us willing to suffer, if need be, outwardly, even as God, in a sense, may be said to have suffered also, in the sense that God has suffered his energy to be entrusted to those of mankind who have no intention of using it correctly because they lie still in the tents of ignorance. And this is the brotherhood teachings also. We must recognize, as he said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. So also he went after as the good shepherd the return of that which was lost, that which had lost its sense of values if it had ever found it somewhere along the line of manifestation of what has been termed life. As Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said, they have never lived, they can wait to die. Because unless we are able to enjoy with a degree of perception the fragrance of life as God intended it, we have never lived. Being satisfied with the husks as the prodigal was, we remain bound to the delusions and cords of the senses with all of its vanities and afflictions. But so it was not intended by God, and so our brotherhood has ever taught contrarywise. But the world today 
as it is steeped in tradition, does not seem to allow itself to truly go back to the great divine traditions, but rather to something that is a few centuries or a few years old and presume that they have captured all the wisdom of heaven. For example, let us take the subject of angels. A very interesting story told by Norman Vincent Peale in Guideposts affirms the fact that a young couple in their early days of marriage were wandering through the woods, the sylvan woods, some beautiful summer afternoon and they heard the murmur of voices behind them harmonious melodious voices approaching and then because these voices had another world quality and because of the great melodic manifestation of these voices they turned to perceive what it was that was approaching expecting to find perhaps a wandering group of boy scouts of children of young people in the woods, not knowing what to find when there in the very air, moving a few feet above the ground were angelic faces and angelic beings, companies of angels actually moving through the groves of trees. They witnessed this. Clearly, not an illusion, not a vision, not a dream, but a tangible, physical manifestation of angels. But people say today they don't exist. And so this couple sat down on a log and they looked at each other, each fearing to tell the other what they had seen for fear the other would think them daft, insane, ridiculous. And then finally one said to the other, did you? Yes, I did. <laughs> and back and forth the expressions went and then finally they agreed to conceal this because he was a young minister in a church and to speak to his congregation of having seen angels was heretical, to say the least. No one would believe him. Everyone would think he was insane. They would soon have him moved by some sort of maneuver. He would no longer have a congregation and perhaps be declared unsafe. And so the young man went through the period of his ministry until he was ready to retire. And then he released his information to Dr. Peel, which was an interesting thing because it shows how our hidebound traditions do not allow us the enjoyment of God's universe. When in reality, God intended us to explore, to keep an open mind and a heart. This does not mean, of course, that we must become involved in uh, spiritualistic or mediumistic phenomena and look to find one of the masters hanging behind every curtain or every little Christmas tree ornament, expect that the masters are going to play on yo-yos and descend into our living room at any minute. This is not necessary. We do not have to become fanatical and expect that God is going to produce all sorts of activities before our eyes all the time just to keep us entertained. But rather we must understand that God is there and have a calm knowing of that. And when something does happen that is extraordinary, we must be prepared to thank him for this extraordinary manifestation. I think it is a very cheap and tawdry activity when people expect that somehow or other every stone that's overturned will suddenly have a God behind it. I think that we may see the living God behind all of that. But we do not have to become imbued with the idea that somehow or other the masters have chosen us to receive every possible magical manifestation of something extraordinary. Why, extraordinary things wouldn't even be extraordinary if they weren't extraordinary. This sounds a bit Gertrude Steinish, but the point is, you know, a rose is a rose is a rose, but the point is that there has to be high points in our life and there has to be what we may call low points or mediocre points, but these are not really mediocre. It's the long haul that brings us to the feet of God, not just the phenomenal things that occur along the way. These others are mileposts. They signify encouragement. They help us to intensify our patience. They give us understanding of grace. But what a wonderful thing it is if the mind be kept open and not reject everything. But I do think it is dangerous for the mind to accept everything. And therefore, I always encourage all my students to challenge anything that I say, to challenge anything if they wish that has been said, because providing we do this with an open mind and love for God, without the 
abominable attitude that some people have that if you don't exactly say everything that I believe, then I'm not going to like it because I want to be Mr. and Mrs. Echo, you know, little Sir Echo. You know, there are people in the world today that all they want to hear is exactly what they believe. Well, if that be the case, of course, there are many people today who trade in God and Christ at the marketplace, who try to sell God to people for dollars because they know that there are people just waiting to hear the echoes of their own sentiments without progress. We don't believe this is right. We believe that the truth and the truth alone can make us free. And we must be free to both accept and reject. But we have long felt that rejections without cause are just as dangerous as acceptations without cause. It is not necessary for us to become a funnel that absolutely takes in everything that exists in the world, every statement about God, every crazy little idea that may be given by some psychic experimenter. This is not necessary. But nevertheless, I mean, we still must not close the door of our heart and mind. And so we must pray for balance, that the Holy Spirit may lead us and guide us into all truth with sanity and affection for truth itself. You know, I, I do think that it is one of the greatest mistakes that people make, and that is the idea as though they were buying a magazine subscription from a salesman at the door, that every idea that's given to their mind, they either have to accept it or have to reject it. You don't have to do either. Why, for goodness sakes, you can have a library of thoughts. You can put them on the shelves and leave them there as long as you want. And you can take them down and look at them and examine them whenever you want. And one by one, as you're able to accept truth, as it fits the jigsaw puzzle of cosmic reality, you can take from these ideas and feed them into the consciousness of genuine approval, heart's approval that lies within you. It is, I think, one of the greatest mistakes for people to just take everything in and accept it. I think it's equally so to reject it. We must understand this because the secret places of God in the earth are one of these ideas that I want to expound on a little to you tonight. And that is in those sacred places where the various events in the life of Christ occurred, for example. We know that Bethlehem was a very special place because it signified the birthplace of our Lord Jesus the Christ. And we know that Calvary's hill has meaning, as does the hill of the Ascension, Bethany's hill. And so all of these specific places in the world like that they are meaningful to us because they involve themselves with those great avatars, with that great Son of God, Jesus Christ, with the birthplace of Lord Buddha, with uh, the birthplaces of all the various avatars that are known. These places are important. But more important than that, one idea that I think has perhaps never been realized by the bulk of mankind but that has been realized by the few almost in every age is the idea of a sweet potato. Well, of course, you're going to say, what are you talking about? You know, did you ever see a sweet potato, how it has these little holes, you know, and you put your finger over the holes, and then you blow a breath of air, and then, of course, if you're proficient at it, you make music with your sweet potato. Well, most people do not realize that the earth itself has focuses on the surface of the earth that attune the planetary body as an instrument, as a divine instrument. And so there are specific places. One of those great places on this earth was the altar on which Abram offered his son Isaac and then the angel appeared. We recently placed our hands upon that stone known as the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. That is one of the secret places of the earth. It is a very sacred place, being a very interesting focus of the brotherhood. But then we're going to go into some more, too. Because Jacob laid his head on a stone, and then he fell asleep, and behind him, in his consciousness, appeared a great stairway leading upward. This is, of course, mystical in a sense of the word, 
but it also is actual, and this is quite interesting. It is mystical because it signifies, it has a message to us that is very, very important. It shows that all people are not at the top of that ladder. It shows that all people are not at the bottom, but rather that at the bottom and at the top, we have landmarks. In other words, we have places there which denote that people cannot fall any lower than that lowest stone and still be on the path, nor can they rise any higher than this highest stone, because once they do, they graduate from the ordinary octave of consciousness and they become imbued with heavenly knowledge beyond the ken of most men. And so we recognize that the ladder that leads upward, leads Godward, is a mystical ladder. And that people are not all in the same position on that ladder. And therefore, just as today a school teacher, a functioning in, shall we say, the high school level, or perhaps in the second year of college, these teachers would know that a child from the first grade <coughs> could not very well come up to the college level and sit down and be able to assimilate all the great truths that are placed there. Now, of course, we have in the world, existing in the world, simplistic attitudes that seem to make everything black and white or gray, three tones, perhaps. A mingling of the black and white is the gray, and the black is the absolute evil, and the white is the absolute good. But nevertheless, these simplistic attitudes are really rhetorical ideas. We can bring them out, we can talk about them, but in reality, they do not signify anything that necessarily is applicable to our world individually because you have so many people and so many steps leading to God that it's very difficult indeed to be able to make it so simplistic. Yet many years ago, in this particular contemporary world. Someone wrote a book that was supposed to be connected with the great masters of wisdom and in this book the statement was made that anything that was complicated was not necessarily of God because God was so simple. And so people have taken that literally without understanding what it really means. Of course people at certain levels would probably thrive a great deal more if illustrations given to them were almost as simple as a chalkboard drawing. And more astute ideas would be difficult for them to assimilate. And the kingdom of God being what it is, the kingdom of God, contains all wisdom and all knowledge, even the highest wisdom and knowledge of God. How matter is constructed, how it is destroyed, how you individually, could actually take your body right from the visible world and make it invisible. Or how you could dissolve your body retaining full consciousness as Christ did. Travel through the air wherever you wanted to go in this world and appear there. But I ask you this question right now. Would this be a practical thing to give this ability to our modern world? Would it not be true as almost in the funny paper characters that individuals that had such ability would use it for theft. Why, they'd go into a bank, they'd knock out the tellers, they'd take the money, and they'd disappear. And there's all kinds of things that people would do. What an awful condition we would have in our world today if control of the weather were vested in everybody, so that everybody knew all the secrets of controlling the weather. Some of you have seen me work on the control of the weather. Well, this was not given to me originally, just at birth like that, that I knew about this. I did not know that I had this power. But it was given to me by God. And I have used it for God's glory and purposes, to serve the brotherhood. But what an awful thing it would be if every single person in this country had the control of the weather. Sometimes people would say, I'd like a little rain. The farmers would say this. They'd say, the, the land is dry. So today we're going to have rain. And someone else would say, well, I want a picnic today. And we'd have absolute chaos. We would not have order if everyone understood this and understood it thoroughly, unless, of course, they understood a great deal more than that. Because the will of God is what we have to try to pursue. The will of God is all important. And this is a big world and a big universe, and there's many people living here, not just one or two people. 
And those that are vested with various types of authority have to understand how to use it and use it wisely. Because God gives it for that purpose. That talents may be given to us and used to his glory, not to our own. The pursuit of his righteousness is the most important gift that we can ever receive. It may seem sometimes, as we stop to think about it, that, well, what do you mean the pursuit of his righteousness? How do I pursue his righteousness? Do you really think that God made statements and propounds ideas that are like hurdles in an obstacle course, so high you cannot jump over? Not so. God has never placed obstacles in a man's pathway. He has simply tempered the wind to the shorn lamb. When men do not have the identity or realization of who and what they are, he keeps his gifts from them in most cases. But some men through violence tear these gifts from God as from themselves. We read about this. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by storm. There are men that would tear the wings off of butterflies. They would tear open a rose. They would take a clock apart and never be able to put it together again just to find out what makes it tick. And when they were through, would they really know? Of course not. Because if they couldn't put it back together, they wouldn't know, you see. But this, these are the things that happen because people do not understand the great tides of reality that gush forth within them. Therefore, we have to pray for wisdom and pray for wisdom that we may truly know and not know just for the sake of knowing, not know to display our knowledge, but use that knowledge humbly and graciously for the glory of God and the good of mankind. We are entrusted with a great deal of wisdom, all of us, but it is at the level that I was talking about, where we are on the stairway, the mystical stairway, because if we start using greater power than we know and then use it dangerously, what may we do in the world? Well, what may we do is what the black magicians are doing all the time. And who are the black magicians? Probably many Christian scientists might say there is no evil. Of course there is no evil in reality. But we live in a finite realm where reality is not readily apparent because of the illusions which men have created and spun. And the prince of darkness, whom Jesus called the prince of this world, that cometh, findeth nothing in me. What does that mean? It means that there are no attachments within us, do you see? There's nothing they can get a hold of us on. If we are, as the world would say, bugged by this idea and that idea, this means that we react. We are reactors. If someone comes alongside of us with a powerful motor car and they sit at the light and they throb the motor, vroom, vroom, and then if they look over at us and straighten their shoulders up and put their foot on the accelerator and give another zoom, and the light changes. That's all we need. It's like waving a flag in front of a bull. I mean, we're off to the races. And down the highway we thunder. In France, they drove 75 miles an hour right through a little town. And they knocked a little girl of 16 or 17 years old way up into the air and down again. And this little child has had years and years and years of suffering because of the carelessness of people with a powerful motor car. Is energy not given to us and all things given to us that we may learn how to use it? Of course it is. We are here in this world as in a great caravan. We are moving along. Oh yes, God and the brotherhood exist. But initiations are not just given for so many dollars. They require so much diligence of soul, so much application of heart, so much meaning. It is not a matter of worldly organization. It is not a matter of worldly fraternity. It is a matter of the spiritual fraternity. It is a matter of patience. It is a matter of grace. It is a matter of love. Above all, of love. For though I have all gifts and all knowledge, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, Paul declared, if I have not charity, I am but a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And so we who wish to do the will of God more than we wish to do our own will, we must make the necessary application. We must change the complexion of the world. The alchemy of change must live in ourselves because if it lives in us, it will also live in what we do and what we do will become an action of unison in the world 
that will ultimately change the whole world thought. Our children will be properly educated. We will not use the criteria of the worldly dollar, but we will use the criteria of alchemy, spiritual alchemy, to bring about the kingdom of heaven, for goodness sakes. Look at Christianity, one of the greatest and most marvelous activities that has ever been brought forth. Look at it. See the hospitals that have been built in the name of Christ. And then watch how the deterioration of these instruments has occurred. Not that there's not a great deal of good done by them today, of course there is, but it has become mechanized. Today it is a, a function of gears turning without oil in many cases, grinding out lives and doing with as they see fit without any application of necessity to the courage of the human soul and the respect of the human soul. One time I came to the window of a hospital and I had a 50 cent coin in my hand and I had a half hour to see my own child. And so I waited patiently while a doctor and a nurse were inside conversing. And finally, after five minutes it ticked away, I knocked with a 50 cent piece on the window. And they looked at me, kind of grinned a little bit and waved their hand. <coughs> Another five minutes went by. Now I had 20 minutes left before I had to be back to my job. So I tapped again very gently and respectfully. And again, they looked a little bit annoyed and turned away, went on with their conversation. And so finally, at 15 minutes, when half of my time had ticked away, and I only wanted to see this child for about a minute, and the nurse would not bring the child over, and yet she was in charge and was supposed to bring that child over. It was a normal visiting hours. I gently went to the door of the room, and I opened it about six inches and I said, excuse me, ma'am. At which time the doctor turned to me and said, you get out of here without a mask on. I said, but sir, I said, you don't have a mask on. He said, I'm a doctor. <laughs> and so we live in this sophisticated world, a world of double standards and double values and double cross, where all kinds of things happen. And yet the educative process, the divine educative process, goes on and on and on. So we must recognize then in this ladder which Jacob saw, that people are not all at the top rung. They don't all give those reactions that we want. And we must not, of necessity, react to circumstances. Yet there are times that we become the scourge of God ourselves. We must, of necessity, sometimes stand up for the values that are important in our age. Back in the time of George Washington, the father of our country, as most of you realize, George III of England was doing many things to the American people who were not then the American people, but the English people. And of course, the Boston Tea Party and Paul Revere's ride and all of those activities were involved in the early revolution, the changes that were brought about by that revolution. And so, what happened in those days tried the souls of men and they had to rise up within themselves and try to demand out of life a better way of life. And this they did. And of course it took courage. They pledged their lives, their honor and their fortunes, their sacred honor, their sacred lives and their fortunes. And they pledged everything they had for the purposes of bringing about the instruments of freedom in this country, of creating the Constitution of the United States as an article or a series of articles that would bring about a better way of life. And today the Constitution is being amended. The chief architects of this, of course, are located right here in Santa Barbara, California. People that wish to change the Constitution of the United States. But if we actually lived by those early constitutional values, we would have a better world instead of a worse world. And we could export these conditions to the world. We could export the values, the way of life that is America to the world. And it would still be of value to the people of other countries. For example, Sweden, rather than borrow just socialism, could borrow Americanism because it would be so beautiful if it followed the Constitution, if people followed the love and the laws of the life that was involved in the early 
pioneers of this country. What they thought and what they felt was the worship of God. Not necessarily a proscription of those ideas, not necessarily just a dictatorial manifestation of those ideas by some firm rule, but rather by what they felt were important in their heart. And they felt that freedom was important to everyone. Today, we live in a great bureaucracy, a bureaucracy that grinds its ears almost resistlessly against even the manifestation of Christ. We have taken Christ out of Christmas. Today, Christ is completely gone, principally from Christmas. All that is left today is the tinsel, the glitter, and the lights, and our commercial aspects. It is so commercialized that computers even figure out exactly how many of any specific article we're going to have to order in our various department stores, and how many will be sold and how many will be left. Truly, the mark of the beast, 666, the number of a man, Truly, this is the most important thing in the eyes of most people, is what can man do? How much money can he make over that particular holiday season? That's more important than anything else to people. But that is not important to God. Because God is the God of the ages, and Christ is the Christ of the ages. And the secret places of the Lord are in the earth not only in the physical world, our great sweet potato in space on which the melodies of God are being played as the retreats of the world are being activated. So I want to say something about those retreats from a standpoint of the retreats alone. By saying that the great white brotherhood has numerous retreats in the world. I won't have time tonight to be able to get into every retreat. But I want to touch on a few. For example, over the Holy Land, there is the resurrection retreat of Jesus and Mary. This is a magnificent retreat. And what is the purpose of that retreat? Well, the retreat exists there to serve the great white brotherhood. But our individuals today, earthbound, are people bound to their bodies? Are they tied to their bodies as if by cords and ropes? Of course not. Because when you sleep at night, if you know the method is outlined in our Keepers of the Flame lessons, for example, and various other teachings and techniques of the Brotherhood, you can escape from your physical body, from being earthbound. And you can travel at night with or without consciousness. And I've done it myself without consciousness often and with using only soul consciousness. And I've also done it with consciousness. I remember several years ago when I was staying at the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago, attending a special convention at Blackstone. And uh, I went to bed one night, and uh, as I was uh, leaving my body, I remembered the trip across the face of America as though it were an actual plane ride. And pretty soon I was in New York and circling around, and, and I came down to the Empire State Building. And there, of course, as you know, there's a huge antenna on top of the Empire State Building, and so I came down on that antenna, and I placed my feet on it, one foot, I should say, and as I placed it on there, I got scared. I don't mind telling you, because I realized that there was a street below. I had not even thought that I was traveling out of the body. I thought that actually I was physically on this, on this uh, statue. I don't mean statue, I mean this tower. And I felt that that's where I was. And I felt that any moment, if I slipped, I might crash and get hurt down to the street. And so eventually I did slip. And I slipped off it, and there I was, and it was a fog. And I was falling in this fog. And the next thing you know, I said, for goodness sakes, I don't have to fall. And so we crossed the Atlantic Ocean, went over to Paris like Lindbergh, you know. And so what did I say to myself on this occasion? You know what I said to myself? I said, well, that's only a dream. I woke up, you see, and I remembered the details. I said, it's only a dream. And now I went down the elevator the next morning. And I went down the elevator, and there, right across from me at the breakfast table, was a little old lady, probably about 75 to 80, maybe even 85. And she sat there at uh, the table, and of course, at that time, I was not a vegetarian, and I was having my bacon and eggs with coffee. It tasted pretty good, and I was really enjoying it. I had a sweet roll sitting there. And this lady, she had ordered a little, a little breakfast of fruit, and she sat there. She was sipping her coffee and having fruit, and she kept looking at me. You know what the Mona Lisa is? You, you, you ever seen the Mona Lisa? Most of you, I think, have seen the Mona Lisa. 
And she sat there, what you call a Mona Lisa smile. You know. And I said to myself, I said, what in the world is going on with this lady? Why is she looking at me with this Mona Lisa look? Well, pretty soon she looked at me and she, <clears throat> I said, yes, I said, how are you? She said, I'm fine. She said, by the way, she said, I was really amused last night, she says, when your foot slipped off the top of the Empire State Building. <laughs> now, was it a dream? You decide. The point is, I knew I was not alone because others were with me. And the thing that you have to realize is that God is not limited by your body. Just because he created your body does not mean that your soul is in that body like an imp in a bottle and you can't get out of it. Of course you can get out of it. You get out of it at death, don't you? When you lay your body down at night, you can also get out of it. Where do you go? Well, you go if you want to where God wants you to go. And so the retreat of Jesus and Mary over the Holy Land is an existent retreat right today. It's just as existent as this room right here, only it has a lot more room in it for a lot more people. When they come into that retreat, there are angels there, great cosmic beings, and they can make you tingle from the tip of your toes to the top of your head with God's energy. And they can give you beautiful ideas, and they can bring you happiness and joy. And the awareness of the Holy Spirit, and the awareness of what God wants to do in the temple of the resurrection flame over the Holy Land. Why, what does it do? I'll tell you what it does if you want to let it work in you. It will renew every single cell in your body. It can renew those cells until they literally glow like fire. It can drive out disease. It can transform your mind. It can promote healing in the whole world order. That's just one retreat. Then go over to Luxor, Egypt, and visit the retreat of Serapis Bay, that great master of the seraphim. That's another retreat, a secret retreat in the world. Then too, right here in America, if you want to go to the Grand Teton Range up in Wyoming, what do you find up there? That's the retreat of Lord Lanto today. And so there are many retreats all over the world. There's the retreat of the God and Goddess Meru down in South America, Lake Titicaca. And all over the world you have various retreats of the masters. Well now, people may say, why are there retreats? Well, I've already told you if you listen real closely. All the earth is holy. You'll agree with me on this? Yet what did God say to Moses in the Sinai Desert? Take off thy shoes from thy feet for the ground whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Why? Because it was holy ground in the Sinai Desert. Don't ask me why. The whole earth is holy, but now God specifies the spot that Moses is standing. It is holy ground. It's a special approach. Now, I think I can tell you this. Right in the middle of your head, Hanging like a ripe cherry is the pituitary gland. This is a focus of cosmic energy within you. Right in the middle of your forehead are the remnants of the pineal gland. And of course, in the old fire teachings, we read that man must climb the 33 steps of the spinal ladder to the place of the skull Golgotha, where the Christ is crucified between the two malefactors, the anterior and posterior lobes of the pituitary gland. We began to get the idea then gradually that God has put focuses within each and every one of us that correspond to the focuses in the earth. Do you understand? That we are keyed, if we will, into those great focuses that are in the earth, even in ourselves. And that through these keys we may clean escape from the error of the consciousness of human criticisms, condemnation, and judgment, of human awareness, of human strata, of the misadventures of human life. And we may find what the mind of Christ is. 
and what the mind has done. And we do not find it vacant. It is not vacant of wisdom, intelligence, and divine drama. The poignancy of the universe is within ourselves. Our fortunes then, as has been said, are not within our stars or the setting of those fortunes within our stars, but within ourselves. We have within ourselves the means, the alchemical means of creating a tie to the universal God. And we can rise master and supreme above the discord that holds us bound until at last the resurrection flame is pulsing in our being. The ascension flame is burning out all of the darkness that otherwise would robe us with robes of darkness rather than light. We may put on the wedding garment of our Lord. We may be prepared to meet him in the air. We may be prepared to meet him in the air today, for he is ever with us. He is ever with man. God, our Savior, manifests not only in Christ, but in every child of creation, as it is Christ's will. How mankind have wronged one another by their lowering concepts of the great divine values that are inherent within man. To live is to live for God, if we will it so. To die is simply a ceasing to be that which we were intended to be. We ourselves today can, if we will, understand the meaning of our master's teaching when he said, I am come that ye might have life and that more abundantly. More abundantly, not less abundantly. He does not intend that we should take the flame of life that he lit within us by the taper of his own love and allow that flickering taper to go out and to have no meaning in the world. Each of us are transformed and transforming as God wills it so, and we ratify his will by our humble submission to that will. Our invitation to the deity to take us and assimilate us into his great, his vast consciousness, his wholeness, because his wholeness is our wholeness, if we will it so. We do not need to submit to the passions of the world that become so excited over every little foolish thing and so oblivious of every great gift which heaven has prepared for us. So the secret places of the Lord are within the earth, yes. They are within the historical patterns, within the mandala, of those historical patterns, the span of history, beyond that which was in the beginning, into the infinity of the heart of God, and beyond even our imagination of the future, the rolling future of the epochs, the manvantaras, the days that lie ahead, beyond all of that is Grace, 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 and more grace. What then must we do that we may be saved? To possess God and to be possessed of God is salvation. God is our Savior. We read, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We should understand that the cross referred to by St. Paul was not merely a Roman instrument of torture, an electric chair, a hangman's noose, an instrument of ending it all for an individual, but rather of bringing about the demise of those qualities of life, which are not qualities of life at all, but rob us, each and every one of us, of all value and of all opportunity. By directing our consciousness toward the criticisms of our fellow men, which produce nothing for us. 
if it were not for the grace of God, we would all be in the same boat. And just to possess knowledge unused does not escape us. Knowledge must be an applied knowledge. Yet the brotherhood remains and has ever remained intently determining to free every individual upon this planetary body. They have never intended failure to intrude its ugly head in our life. But the idea of failure, like the idea of, of the serpent in Eden, entwines itself around about the tree of life and declares, Thou shalt not surely die. Perhaps not so, but this we know. Every quality of life that is not God shall die. And if we will to make our life filled with every quality that is not God, to exercise life as a trampoline, to jump up and down and enjoy our brother's discomfiture. If we would spread abroad in harmony and pain and darkness and afflict others without mercy, as we sow, so shall we reap. Yet my soul hath no pleasure, God has said, in the death of the wicked. It is not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should have the knowledge of eternal life. The knowledge of eternal life may not of necessity seem to be imparted by any one organization, but then, after all, the divine alphabet, from A to Z, the codification of divine value is expressed in 26 letters in the English language. And in a host of words, but a finite variety thereof, which a Webster dictionary, written by Noah Webster and now embellished upon by a host of scholars, will convey to us today, if we will, a finite number of words, and yet these words are constructed and reconstructed and molded into ideas, or ideas mold them, as the case may be. And we hear these ideas. Some are simplistic and some are involved. Those of you who are familiar, for example, with a mind such as C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Screw Tape Letters, a fellow of Magdalen College, Oxford University, recognized that this man was a genius, a man of vast and great understanding. But you all know deep in your heart that he was capable of the simplest, of entertaining the simplest idea, as well as the most complex. It is not sinful to be able to speak purely and simply, nor is it sinful to speak in a manner that is calculated to engage the mind in varying ideas and exercises that are the cadences of divine harmonies. There's nothing wrong in that, for when one comes to a point where they are able to understand the wealth of true cultural values they will be able to understand that these also lie in the domain of God and do not berate simplicity. A true culture does not berate simplicity. It accepts it for the earliest mathematical formulas that are almost childlike in their simplicity all start in a digital sense from one to ten. And it is multiples of these values like our scale with its seven notes that enable us to assimilate piece by piece the divine puzzle. And yet the value of God does not lie in sophistication alone, if at all, but rather in the willingness of the heart to submit itself to divine grace. But we have ever found one thing, and that is this, that once the heart bows low, once the mind gets down on its own knees to God and recognizes that God is the formulator, the creator, the designer, the architect of the universe. There's always a door, a mystical door, before them, a period to our gaze. And as we pass through that door, we find the ability to alphabetize. We find the ability to understand, to work with these values, and they are no longer complex or falsely sophisticated but they are spiritual and they are the mind of Christ 
For I am here to tell you tonight that this universe in all of its secret places of endowment, insofar as this world order is concerned, even the physical appearance world, is mathematically precise. For example, I could move to a certain spot on this stage and absolutely disappear from your view. But if I did, I would violate the brotherhood completely. Because we are not working in this way today. But it is so, nevertheless. There is a precise fourth dimensional way of disappearing from physical view. In some cases, by merely entering into little slots in matter itself and stepping out, which was known by Jesus Christ and he used it many, many times. He used it when they came to push him over the brow of the hill. He used it again and again. So he, he disappeared from their sight. But these are known mathematical, precise laws. And then there are other ways. You can dissolve the body completely. And when you dissolve it completely, it will not so easily reappear. But it will appear where it's supposed to. But the point is that there is a way which, for example, black magicians can create disease germs by misqualifying divine substance. And when these disease germs are breathed into the human nostril, disease manifests unless the individual is prepared to counteract such activity. I want you to know that at Salem, for example, in the early witchcraft trials, there were very vicious forces acting there. Forces that had acted in monasteries in Europe long before that. Forces that today in our colleges are still acting and helping to create the cult of drugs, sex, and discord. But what is it all for? It's because it promises men liberty. But the people who make that promise are themselves the servants of corruption. And our activity under the direction of the Brotherhood has taken manifold large numbers of people out of the drug culture and brought them to the understanding where they can plainly see that the living Christ today dispenses the essence of his glory to man right through his heart and mind. He kindles the mind. He explains to man what he can be. And man finds the answers in Christ, in God. So let us be aware of the constructivism of the organization. Let us be aware of the constructivism of God only because God is so constructive, so creative, so benign, so beautiful. Can the organization, our organization, the Summit Lighthouse, dispense or radiate this light out because it is already in the universe? It's already in our heart. It's already in everybody. And therefore, everybody responds to it if they will allow themselves to respond. If they won't, the loss is there. But we have no feeling about that. Whatever we do is humbly done. Whatever we do is graciously given. If I seem to be breaking my arm by patting our organization on the back, please understand that all glory be to God. Yet what has been, how far the boat has rowed, this is not nearly so important as how far it will go. And it will go because God wills it so. And why does he will it so? Primarily because we have eroded our values in the world today as a nation. We have eroded our values in the whole world order. We perpetuate war, yes. But why? Because the dragon has come down to us having great wrath. But the purposes of life are not perceived in the midst of all of our religions. But in men are Mohammedans, worshipping in mosques, Buddhists, worshipping in Buddhist temples, or out in the highways and byways of life, followers of the Tao, or whether they follow Jesus the Christ. Christendom, as well as what has been called paganism, has all failed. They are all gone out of the way, and they have all become unprofitable because they do not understand the basic truth that Christ lives in them as he lives in the world. And so the secret places of God in the world are of great and mighty value. 
and all of you who have in yourselves any degree of receptivity to God must in this day and age hear the Macedonian cry. You must be willing to respond to what God has need of. We have need of revitalizing the world. And if you feel this way, you're going out into this community and wherever you live and you're going to try to draw people in to this Light of the World conference that we're going to have soon. You're going to try to light a candle for the Lord upon the illumined Christmas tree of wise master building because we need wise master building. At a time when darkness is sown as seed in the world community and it reaps darkness in the world. We need light bearers who will bear the light for Christ and for God. We need people who will stand up and not be afraid to be counted. There is enough terror that flieth by night and there's enough of arrows that fly by day. We do not need more of that. We need more of grace and more of truth and more of the wholeness of God. And so I urge upon you tonight, only in the capacity of God's bishop, I urge upon every one of you the realization that you can count, you can do something that will significantly help to roll back the tides of darkness in the world order. This is what we're all doing. We're going to have a wonderful class. There's going to be great glory and great beauty brought forth in that class. But the perpetuation of that beauty will momentarily depend upon you individually. Until then, we are all able to hold up the taper of the Lord in the world order. There will come into the world community those from other planets and other systems of worlds who are the children of God. I'm talking about spiritual beings now. They will come in and hold or help you to hold up until your understanding be increased to where you won't really need them anymore. And then your teachers will no longer be in a corner, but you will see them face to face. And you will commune with them. And as you commune with them, you will also become like them. And you will see them as they are. You will see Christ as he is. You will see God as he is. And you will help to build the kingdom of heaven on this earth. People do not seem to understand that the construction of the government of the United States itself is a form of the kingdom of heaven, or so it was intended to be. We read of the United Nations. We read of the desires of men to unite people in one great Babylonian episode. But it will not work until Christ be enthroned in the heart. Because unless Christ be enthroned in the heart, then darkness stalks our land. Because each man would have it be his way without understanding the universal way of the kingdom of God. The secret places of the earth that are within you are alchemical keys. Like the tubes or transistors in your radio apparatus, they are placed there by God in order to give you higher attunement. Use them wisely and well and esteem them dearly and watch your consciousness and awareness grow with the fires that inflame space with the love of God. But abuse them and neglect them and become involved in the dust of the ages and you will find yourselves passing into obscurity and oblivion as this age also will do unless it summons the wisdom to resurrect itself and to bring the glow of Christ's reality to the nations now when the nations need it as never before. When Jesus came long ago, when that tiny babe to whom so much homage was paid came into the world, he was the great light in a darkened world. Do not despair because darkness today rules the night of our world. For the day star from on high has visited us. And if you will understand what that means, you will create in yourself, by consciously willing it so, a climate of perpetual welcome to the kingdom of heaven. And you will spread that welcome over the heart of a waiting world. And thus, we will recreate a new nativity, a 
among the nations and bring them to the feet.